Hello Info Person, this is Anton, and today we're going to once again talk about Uranus. And yeah, pretend I made some kind of a funny Uranus joke right here. Anyway, so we do actually have some really exciting discoveries coming from Uranus, some actually solving several mysteries, and some somewhat surprising. And because this is one of those objects we've only visited once during the Voyager 2 mission, discovering anything new from this bizarre planet is always super exciting. But I guess first, let's start with some of the new observations and some of the new images, in this case actually captured by two separate telescopes. From the Hubble telescope, right next to the observations from the New Horizons probe. Here's basically what it looks like side by side. But there is actually a really important reason why this was done. This was actually a kind of an experiment in order to test our observations when it comes to exoplanets. And so here in late 2024, researchers used Hubble and New Horizons to take a picture from two different perspectives. Here's roughly how these perspectives compare. But the point here was to study direct imaging of various exoplanets, specifically when it comes to things like, for example, habitability. And to study this, they wanted to capture a planet from two different perspectives and from two different distances. But before this was done, they did have an expectation. They basically expected Uranus to appear slightly differently in different visual filters, but potentially still look somewhat similar. And instead, they actually discovered that Uranus was a lot dimmer in the New Horizons data compared to predicted values. And because New Horizons here was much farther away, approximately 61 AU away from planet Earth, here the observations were kind of mimicking what we usually get with various planets around other star systems. And so because it appeared dimmer, it meant that the angle of observation actually mattered. So here, because this was observing the planet during its partial phase, when only a portion of the planet is illuminated by the sun, the resulting brightness was much, much dimmer. And additionally, they also discovered that during this partial phase, the atmosphere of Uranus was actually reflecting light differently too. As in Uranus appeared different in color and was showing very different molecules compared to what was visible to Hubble. And that by itself was a really important discovery because when observing other exoplanets, we might actually overestimate certain things or might see things that were previously underestimated. And so this particular test was really important for future observations of planets where we might one day discover some kind of habitable conditions. But naturally, this is the first such observation, so basically this is just the start. Additionally, we had another study and a separate observation that basically solved one of the older mysteries when it comes to Uranus. And here this was the observations between 1992 and 2018, mostly in the infrared light, that established that for some reason the upper atmosphere of Uranus, or the so-called thermosphere, for some reason was cooling down and went from approximately 700 Kelvin down to about 450 Kelvin in just three decades. And it was not clear what's happening here or why. Now generally, for a lot of different planets, including Jupiter and Saturn, there is a region above the atmosphere that's usually super hot. Earth actually has this too, and it's usually somewhere between exosphere and mesosphere, and normally starts at an altitude of 80 kilometers. And even for Earth, temperatures can be really high, between 2000 and 2500 Celsius or 3600 to 4500 Fahrenheit. Here's roughly what this layer looks like when seen from outer space. But for some reason, for Uranus, this layer has been continuously cooling down ever since the first observations in the 1990s. And for Uranus, this layer is much, much higher. It goes as far as 50,000 kilometers above the surface. And so during the Voyager 2 flyby, this was in 1986, it was able to measure the temperature here and this was our first value and the first measurement. And ever since then, scientists have been continuously measuring thermosphere by mostly using infrared telescopes. Naturally, they've been doing the same for other planets as well. And of all the planets, it's really only Uranus that seems to experience these unusual cooling changes. And here at first, scientists were not sure how to explain this. It didn't appear to be the effect of seasonal changes, and it wasn't connected to the solar 11-year cycle. But the new study by Masters and his team potentially solves this problem. As you can see from the title, the answer seems to be solar wind. And looks like here, the solar wind, which also declined in power in the last 30 years, seems to have influenced the magnetic field around Uranus, because apparently it has a lot of control over Uranus' atmosphere compared to planets like Earth. And so because of the declining solar wind, which is basically a bunch of plasma particles, the magnetosphere of the planet very likely expanded, which then basically led to the expansion of the thermosphere, which led to the overall cooling. 
And so here this seems to be the effect from the overall decline of the solar wind hitting the Neptunian atmosphere. And though by itself this might not sound too important, it actually is. Mostly because this actually suggests that for these really far away planets, the solar wind seems to have much more effect when it comes to the control and the heating of the upper atmosphere. Here you can actually see there's a graph showing a direct correlation between the pressure from the solar wind, the Uranus magnetosphere, and the temperature in the Uranus thermosphere. And so here, because the number of photons reaching Uranus is actually relatively minuscule because the sun is really far away, it's really the solar wind that seems to play a much bigger role. And this is extremely different from what we've seen around other planets in the solar system. And so for planets like Earth, and even for planets like Jupiter, the photons, or I guess sunlight, controls the temperature directly. And that of course includes the temperature of thermosphere. But for much farther planets, it really seems to be the solar wind, or the plasma coming from the eruptions from the sun, that does actually change quite dramatically depending on the solar weather. And this of course implies that we can expect something very similar for a lot of different exoplanets that orbit at faraway distances. If these planets have a large magnetosphere, and if they orbit far enough from the star, most of the control of the temperature is going to be done by the stellar wind and not by the heat emitted from the star. So stellar radiation, or sun radiation in this case, is basically not very significant. But when it comes to Uranus and its magnetosphere, there is actually another mystery. And this is once again from the Voyager 2 that visited Uranus approximately 50 years ago. During its flyby, it actually discovered that for some reason, the magnetosphere of Uranus was super different from what astronomers expected. Not only was it very strange in shape and seemed to be somewhat lopsided, it was also extremely strong. It contained a super powerful radiation belt whose intensity was very similar to Jupiter. And this was kind of hard to explain and was completely unexpected. I mean, this was a much smaller planet, way, way smaller than Saturn, and Saturn did not have anything similar. Not to mention that the pole in this case was also shifted dramatically compared to the spin of the planet. And more importantly, there was no actual way to explain any of this and no known source for any of these energetic particles that could produce such an intense belt around Uranus. These belts are basically made out of plasma or ionized gas, and it wasn't clear what this plasma was coming from. On top of this, Voyager 2 also revealed that none of the moons were producing any interaction with this magnetic field, essentially suggesting that all of the moons here were entirely inactive, not producing any emissions and without any geological activity. And that was a bit strange, because when looking at moons like Miranda, its surface actually does suggest a lot of geological activity. So maybe it was just not active anymore. But we might finally have an answer to all of this, and it seems to be just an anomaly. Turns out that at the time of the flyby, something actually happened to the sun. Something that only happens approximately 4% of the time. Here we had an enormous emission of that solar wind. So basically Voyager 2 potentially saw Uranus during an extremely rare cosmic occurrence. Because the solar wind hit Uranus at just the right time, it actually compressed its magnetosphere, pushing plasma out of it and creating these powerful belts. And so these very powerful radiation belts were possibly only powerful during this time. And had Voyager 2 arrived at a different time, like for example right now, it would very likely see a completely different picture. In this case, a much bigger magnetic bubble and very weak radiation belts. All of this was described in a study by Jamie Jasinski and his team in a study that was just published in Nature. So basically here the answer was an extremely high pressure from the solar wind once again that very likely just skewed our observations. Which kind of suggests that the magnetosphere of Uranus is potentially not that different from other planets after all, or would definitely appear very differently if we tried to visit this planet once again. While also confirming that this is still one of the most misunderstood planets in the solar system, and more importantly, a planet that potentially contains super exciting moons. And that's of course the other two discoveries. Unlike previous assumptions that the moons were basically geologically inactive, this study suggests that some of them could be active and possibly do interact with Uranus at all times. And here we have two studies about two separate moons. The first one is the famous Miranda. Turns out all of these very bizarre and hard to explain features on the surface potentially hint at ocean hiding underneath. And so here the study by Kelly Strom and his team tried to explain all of these very strange, very bizarre shapes as if something scratched the surface of Miranda by conducting computer simulations and by trying to match these simulations 
with what could be happening inside. And while the conclusion is that these seem to be the result of tidal forces from the neighboring moons pulling on Miranda for billions of years, but these features could only form if there was a very specific type of structure inside. And that structure has to be something like this. The best match here is if Miranda has a huge ocean, possibly 60 miles or 100 kilometers deep, but beneath 30 kilometers or 19 miles of brittle ice. And because this moon is only like 230 kilometers in radius, it means that this ocean would be almost half of the entire moon, which is really, really surprising. But I guess not surprising if you consider how strange this moon looks. And so all of these shapes were possibly the result of resculpturing of the moon because it is basically kind of malleable. All of this liquid inside makes it very easy for it to change appearance, especially if there are tidal forces close to it. And so all of this is just a result of external stress. It would have to have some kind of an ocean at least 100 million years ago, and possibly even today. And the only way the ocean would be still liquid is once again through tidal interactions between Miranda and its partners. And so in essence, this is probably one of the best explanations we have for what's happening here and for why Miranda is just so bizarre. But then there's another moon called Ariel. And Ariel is also now super exciting. A separate study tried to understand the surface of Ariel as well, and especially those unusual white patches. Here we know that Ariel, for some reason, is actually covered with a lot of carbon dioxide. And here we're talking about carbon dioxide ice, especially on its trailing hemisphere. And though finding ice so far away from the sun might not be an issue, it is an issue when it's carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide should actually turn into gas unless the temperatures are even colder. And the study by Richard Cartwright and the team that used James Webb to try to figure this out potentially found a solution. Here, to their surprise, on top of carbon dioxide, they also discovered carbon monoxide. And carbon dioxide deposits were also extremely rich. This is actually some of the richest carbon dioxide ice deposits in the entire solar system. In some locations, the thickness of this ice can be as much as one centimeter or even more in thickness. But carbon monoxide made no sense whatsoever. This gas usually disappears unless the temperature is down to about 30 Kelvin. But the temperature on the surface of Ariel is expected to be 60 Kelvin, so at least 30 degrees warmer. And that of course meant that something on the surface was continuously replenishing all of this ice before it becomes a gas. And the only way this could be achieved is through maybe some kind of a cryovolcanic activity, or essentially through geological activity, confirming that Ariel is also geologically active. And so here all of this ice very likely escapes through various cracks, eventually depositing on the surface, which also confirms that Ariel seems to contain a lot of these substances underneath. And on top of this, it also contains a lot of carbonate minerals, or a lot of different salts that can only be made through interaction with liquids, which also suggests some kind of an ocean, just like Miranda. And so basically both of these moons potentially contain a subsurface liquid ocean that could still be liquid even today, and thus could have a very high chance to be basically habitable, or at least have conditions for potential habitability and somewhat unusual life-sustaining environments very similar to what existed on early Earth. Naturally, this is very similar to what we observe around Europa, Enceladus, and other ice moons, but finding this on Miranda and Ariel is a little bit unexpected. And the only way these oceans are possible is once again if these moons are tidally interacting with each other, which creates a lot of heat inside. And so this basically suggests that any kind of a gas giant that contains large moons orbiting close to each other has a very high chance to have moons with large oceans and, possibly, life-sustaining conditions. But obviously, we're not going to know more about these oceans or these moons until a mission to Europa in the next few years. We're going to be talking about this mission when it actually starts, but, at least for now, these are still really exciting observations and really exciting discoveries. We'll come back and talk more about Uranus in some of the future videos, or you can learn about previous discoveries in the video in the description. Thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.